He's Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Tonight for our time in the Bible. And we do pray that the Lord bless the young people. I appreciate Brother Nye filling in. Uh, we had a good trip yesterday on the bus. Uh, uh, you know, oh thank, oh, thank you, sir. And uh, we had a good trip yesterday on the bus to the, wherever we went, Rapid Am Baptist <laughs> Camp. And we got on there. I tried to pre pretend like you do on the airplane, you know. And I said, now, this is a Maranatha Express. And uh, like, on the, like on the airplane, you know, if you're not going to Rapid, As Rapid Am Baptist Camp, you are on the wrong plane. All right. And so, <laughs> you ever heard them say that on the airplane? Uh, at least they try to break it up and make things different. Those poor, those poor stewardesses, when they do the whole seatbelt thing, they, well, I was going to say they look like some people in church, but I better not. <laughs> well, let's preach, amen, Ephesians chapter number 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, we had a good time. We had some turbulence along the way. Uh, we had a guy that slammed on the brakes and cut through the authorized only, uh, uh, what do you call that, turnaround at the middle of the interstate, and uh, I'll let you know the uh, bus brakes work, amen, they work well, and we thank God for his protection, praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter number 2, and I want to begin reading here in verse number 1. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, uh, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ Jesus, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we are thankful uh, for the opportunity of worship. God, I pray that you'll help us tonight not to take for granted the opportunity that we have for the Holy Spirit of God to speak to us. Lord, we pray that you will indeed help us to worship in spirit and in truth. And Lord, that that truth might work in our heart, work in our life and draw us close to you. Help me to be a blessing, Lord, to your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach a message tonight entitled, Look How Far You've Come. Look how far... You've come. Now, I was thinking about Sunday and the, and the hymn that we sang before we observed the Lord's table, that hymn at Calvary. And the fourth verse there where we sang, Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. And uh, sometimes, as we, like we mentioned on Sunday night, sometimes we don't give enough thought thought to the way and the ways and the manner in which God has blessed us because of salvation. That's what I want to talk about tonight, because I greatly fear that a number of God's people and a number of uh, our churches are focused on so many other things in this world and in this life that we forget the reason why that we ought to serve the Lord with gladness. Uh, that we ought to keep our heart and mind stayed on Him, like the Bible says, so that we can become increasingly a spiritual people with the power of God on our life and on our work. Ephesians chapter number 2 talks about the great blessing of salvation. There are actually two aspects to the chapter. Uh, the first has to do with a contrast of conditions. The latter part of the, uh, of the chapter has to do uh, with the difference in relationships. Uh, and you and I, if we're, sa if we're saved tonight, have experienced both of these changes in our life. Now tonight as we begin then, let's think about, uh, and, and just kind of go back a little bit and try to remember, if we can, what our condition was before we got saved. 
what life was like before you trusted Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says here in, uh, in, in the first ten verses, it deals with this contrast of conditions before and after. Uh, and the, the Bible's clear here that before salvation, sin worked in us. He talks about that in the first three verses uh, and gives a full-length picture of the terrible spiritual condition that you and I were in before we got saved. He said before we trusted Christ as Savior, we were dead in trespasses and sins, he says in verse number 1. That means spiritually dead. The fundamental idea in death is not cessation, that is the end of existence, it is separation. Uh, physical death is the separation of the soul and the spirit from the body. Spiritual death uh, is the separation of the spirit of God or from the spirit of God and eventually leads to the separation of the body and the soul from God. That's what the Bible says when it talks about this is the second death. All those that did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ one day, the Bible says, will be cast in the lake of fire. They're to be eternally separated from God. This is the second death. Death in the Bible is always a separation. And spiritual death is the absence of that highest life that God uh, first uh, introduced to man in the Garden of Eden before the fall, before Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Uh, that, uh, that higher life that he intends for us to enjoy, that, uh, enjoy, that communion with him. We knew nothing of that before we were saved because we were spiritually dead and uh, that, that's the, that separation from the life giver before we trusted Christ. Spiritual death is an ongoing condition of all of those that are outside that do not know the Lord. Uh, it, it means they're unable to understand and to appreciate spiritual things. Because they're spiritually dead. They possess no spiritual life uh, and uh, can do nothing in and of themselves to please God. And so just as a person physically dead does not respond to physical stimuli, those who are spiritual dead, spiritually dead do not respond to spiritual things. It's always been that way. Now I'm going to ask you something tonight. Those of you that have been saved, you ever read through the book of Ephesians, you know it talks about our great spiritual blessings we have in Christ Jesus. I wonder, have you ever thought about those spiritual blessings? Do you realize they'd mean nothing to you tonight if you never knew the Lord? Because you're spiritually dead. Before you knew Him, you had no... I mean, there are people that are religious, but not spiritual. And there's a difference between the two. Uh, uh, so, uh, a corpse cannot hear the conversation going on at the funeral. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, uh, funerals are obviously more for those that are living than those that have passed on. Uh, so it is with the inner man of the unsaved person. His spiritual faculties are not functioning. They cannot function until God gives them life. And the reason for this, this, uh, this death that you and I knew before we were saved is because of trespasses and sins, he tells us in verse 1. The Bible's clear, the wages of sin is death uh, and uh, separated from God. Do you remember those days? Do you remember what it was like not to know the Lord? Do you remember the darkness of it all? Uh, and what, at least now, uh, see, uh, uh, appears as darkness. Back then we thought it was maybe fun or enjoyable or fulfilling or some other crazy thing. Why? Because we were spiritually dead. And if God has done anything spiritually wonderful in your life, it's because He gave you life at the moment of salvation. He quickened you. When you got saved, I'm glad He quickened me to spiritual things. Let me tell you, the unbeliever is not sick. He's dead. He doesn't need resuscitation, he needs resurrection. 
And all lost sinners are dead. The only difference between one sinner and another is the state of decay. When you think about it. The lost derelict on Skid Row may be more outwardly decayed than the unsaved society leader, but, uh, but as far as the Bible is concerned and spiritually speaking, there's no difference between them. They're, all, they're both dead. One corpse cannot be more dead than another. And so uh, that means that you and I, before we were saved, we lived in a vast graveyard filled with people who are dead while they live. Not only did the Bible say before we got saved we were dead, but the Bible says before we got saved we were disobedient. In verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We were, we were, uh, we were uh, spiritually uh, dead, uh, and uh, this disobedience was the thing that got us there. The beginning of man's spiritual death was disobedience. <laughs> God said in the day that thou, we're talking about the tree in the, uh, in the garden of Eden, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And Satan said, ye shall not surely die. And because those two in the garden believed the lie of the devil, they sinned and experienced immediate spiritual death. And ultimately, physical death. Look here. <laughs> Brother, when Lazarus got raised from the dead, I guarantee you one thing, he didn't have any interest in going back in the tomb. So why in the world do people profess to know Christ as Savior and want to try to live back in the world? It don't make any sense uh, biblically, does it? We're, before we were saved, we were disobedient. Oh, how disobedient I was to the Word of God and to the work of God. Uh, there are three forces that encourage man in his disobedience. That is the world, the devil, and the flesh. And you see them here. In this passage of Scripture, you see the world in verse 2 of, cha of chapter 2. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. Now if you're born again and the Spirit of God is stirring in your soul, you see that, that phrase there that you walked according to the course of this world. Uh, and you think to yourself, oh my, uh, that is a terrible way to go. But only because we've been given life. Otherwise, it was the only course you and I knew. Uh, and it was the only course we, could, we were comfortable in. I don't have to tell you that the world system puts pressure on us every day to try to get us to conform to its standard. That's why the Bible says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. And I'll tell you one thing, brother, cable television won't renew your mind. Tabloid magazines won't renew your mind. Uh, the entertainments of this world will not renew your mind. Only by the Spirit of God and the good Word of God can our mind be renewed. And I'm thinking that sometimes we lose the joy of our salvation because our mind is so full of carnal and fleshly and worldly things that we cannot know the joy of the Lord. The unsaved person, either consciously or unconsciously, is controlled by the values and attitudes of this world. But you and I, if we're not careful, can be, can be the same as believers. Controlled by the attitudes of the world. <laughs> I'm glad I don't understand politics. Uh... I would imagine I might be just a little bit crazy if I did. Of course, that's what they said. If you was a missionary, you had to be crazy. But, uh, but when, you, when, you, when you watch what's going on in the world around us, brother, you think to yourself, what have these people lost their mind? Well, the fact of the matter is they never had it. Unless they've been born again. Otherwise, the only thing they know is to operate according to the course of this world. 
And so there is the world, and then there's the devil. And in verse 2, he says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, that's the devil. The power of the air is Satan's uh, 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 horde uh, of demons that operate to carry out his will. You know, people used to say the radio was the devil because of the, uh, of the air and the prince and power of the air. You know that? But that's, <laughs> that's not what it's talking about at all. It's talking about uh, what Ephesians tells us, uh, you know, are those principalities and powers of darkness that are working against us and that before we were saved controlled us. I'm glad tonight that the, this, this, uh, this spirit of uh, this uh, verse number two, uh, yeah, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Uh, I'm glad that the devil is not omnipresent. He's a created being. He has hordes of demons that do his bidding for him. Uh, but uh, unlike God, he is not omnipresent. He influences the lives, listen, of all unbelievers. Have you read this book and, re and realized what the Bible says about the devil and how wicked and dark he is? And to realize that before we were saved, he is the one, that spirit uh, of disobedience that controlled our life. It's a frightening thought, really. Telling us lies, lies we believed. Lies that would have eventually caused us to perish in hell had we not heard about Jesus. He wants to make people children of disobedience. He disobeyed God. He wants you to disobey God as well. And one of his chief tools for getting people to disobey God is lies. He is a liar and the father of it, John 8, 44. Uh, he might... Uh, uh, he might use uh, in some form the truth. He quotes the Bible. But when he does it, he's always got some deceptive end in mind. He's a liar. He's lying to you on every hand he can to get you to disobey God, to ruin your life and, and to ruin that family uh, and all of that God's plan and purpose for your life. And the unsaved multitudes in today's world, uh, in today's world system, disobey God because they believe the lies of the devil. Think about it. That was the power that was work. Hey, that was working in you and me before we got saved. Not only the the, the, the world and the devil, but then the flesh. In verse three. Among whom also look here. We all had our conversation in time past. In the lust of our flesh, if fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as other. You ever heard somebody say, Well, I'm a pretty good person, not according to verse 3. And he don't he don't leave any room. Uh, he says we were all partakers uh, of that lifestyle and that belief system. Look here. Uh, conversation is lifestyle in times and in, uh, in the past the lust of our flesh the fulfilling of the desires of the flesh and the mind brother I've been down that road and I know the end of it and it ain't worth it it's not worth the flesh the flesh and the mind refer to that fallen nature that we're born with that wants to control our body and mind and make us disobey God and so as a result here then uh, of uh, this, uh, uh, this deadness and uh, of this disobedience, the Bible says that they're doomed. In verse 3, we were by nature the children of wrath. What wrath? The wrath of God's judgment. Man, God is so good and so faithful and so loving and so merciful and so long-suffering. Uh, but sometimes the Bible's clear that because God does not send judgment immediately, men and women become presumptuous on His grace. And we live like the devil and disobey Him, thinking, well, we'll just rely on God's grace. 
That's a Bible, the Bible word for that is lasciviousness. I wonder sometimes if you and I even believe what the Bible says about God's judgment. It's a frightening thought. I don't want to see it. I want to be spared from it. We talk about hell, but sometimes I wonder, do we really believe in it? We're doomed. We were doomed. By nature, the children of wrath. By deed, the children of disobedience. Condemned already, the Bible says, because we had not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Man cannot save himself. Because he is a sinner. And that's what we were. Do you remember those days? When I read verse 2 and 3, I see my high school years. I see the early years of my adulthood in the military. It's all written there in Ephesians 2, 2 and 3. I see it. And I can remember the trouble that came because of it. And the sorrow and the burden. But... Look how far you've come. At uh, salvation. Well, before salvation, sin worked in us. But at salvation, God worked for us. Look at it, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. That's God. Amen. That's God intervening on my behalf. And God intervening on your behalf. He intervened in my life, uh, first of all, by way of a witness. That witness's name was Joel Farr. F-A-R-R, not F-I-R-E from North Carolina. Joel Farr was the, was the first one to really seriously talk to me about the Lord. To encourage me to get saved. To invite me to church. He, he was a co-worker of mine in the military. And God used him to intervene in my life. And I picked at him and made fun of him and called him all kinds of names. I thought he was, must have been the silliest, silliest, boringest man that ever walked the face of the planet. And then I started reaping the end of my ways. Drunkenness and debauchery. Life become a wreck. Come, off a, come out of jail off a drunk. And the first person I called was Joel Farr. Because I knew that Joel was concerned for me. He was sincere in his effort. He wasn't trying to check off some fundamental independent Baptist religious block to tell me about Jesus so he didn't have to get in trouble with God when he went to heaven. He was concerned for my soul. And I called him. God's love intervened in Joel Farr. And then God let me experience the trouble of my ways. The end result of boo. Sometimes we think that God's love is, is that which delivers us. But sometimes the love of God uh, forces us to face the end of our ways. So we come to the end of ourselves. Uh, so we'll look to Jesus. I mean, brother, we were in a bad way, serious trouble, hopeless, helpless, doomed, lost, condemned, blind to the facts. But God, rich in His mercy, reached out to you and to me. He graciously allowed us to have our eyes and our hearts and our minds open to the truth. And from that point forward, we see a totally different story. At salvation, God worked for us in verse 4. He loved us. Did you know if there never was a sinner on the face of the planet, God would still love? Because that's who He is. I'm glad He lets us experience His love. 
But that's who He is. He is love. He is rich in mercy. That is God withholding what we deserve. Uh, he is rich in grace. That is allowing us to experience those things that we do not deserve. And by these two things, it's made possible for sinners to be saved. That excites me about the world around us. You and I, boy, we sit around and bark about them. You know, uh, this fella, the neighbor down the road, whatever. Sorry, dog, don't live right, don't do right. Brother, God is rich in mercy, rich in grace. And he'll save them just like he saved you. Amen. And so he loved us. <laughs> and that love was proven at Calvary, where God displayed his hatred of sin. And his love for people. But then not only does the Bible say he loved us, but he quickened us. In verse 5, even when we were dead, dead, in sins hath quickened, that's life, quickened us together with Christ. We didn't even know what living was till God saved us. We didn't have any idea what life should be until God saved us. And then he saved us and gave us eternal life. And then Jesus said he wants us to have life and that more abundantly. And you and I do just like the, uh, the uh, uh, Israelites and, and try to get back into Egypt. Why? I keep thinking over and over as I think about this message, what Paul said when he talked about the old life. He said, what fruit had you in those things whereof you are now ashamed? There's nothing there. There's nothing there to help you. And that's what God was trying to tell the nation of Israel as he led them to the promised land. And so he made us alive. Now watch, it's not just that. But when you look at verse 6, he hath raised us up together. And that's talking about the resurrection. And made us sit together together. In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hey, you and I didn't even deserve God's look. Much less a seat at the table with Jesus. Oh, that makes us, hey, that makes us wonder in awe at the great love of God and faithfulness of God for us. Not only does he save us, but then as far as he's concerned, we're already with Christ in heaven. And that speaks of the eternal nature of our salvation. Oh, aren't you glad, brother, that when you got saved you, you, and, and understood in the Bible, the fact that your salvation is eternal in Christ. I wouldn't want to be some of these poor souls that have believed the lie of the devil that they can be saved one minute and lost the next. Who would want to live under that torment? Who would believe that a God of love would actually make that as truth in this world? You know what? This idea, well, I'm, you know, I got to get saved, but then I got to keep myself saved. Do you realize that that's a slap in the face of Jesus Christ? God, God is not, the Bible's clear that God will share his glory with no man. And if you and I, whether we could earn our salvation or keep it, that would bring glory to us, not to him. And so from the beginning, God said, that's not, brother, the way it's going to be. I'm going to save you. And I'm going to keep you by my grace and by my power so that through you I get glory. Amen. I'm glad about that. Because that, set, hey, that settles that thing. God raised us up. He made us sit with Christ in heavenly places. He made us sit with Christ in heavenly places. Oh, would to God our hearts and minds were more heavenly than they are. Our conversation, the Bible says, is in heaven. And then he says down here in verse 7, <laughs> that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. <laughs> and not only did he raise us up 
and make us to sit with Christ in heavenly places. But the Bible says he's made us objects of his highest favor. You say, well, verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show. Show to who? The angels. That's what I believe. The angel. I think I mentioned on Sunday that the angels don't understand salvation. Angels don't get saved. I don't even believe angels can repent. Why? Because they have the, the, the knowledge of sight already. They've already all been, they're all created beings. And some of them decided to follow the devil, kicked out of heaven, and so it was a willful rejection of the God. Uh, that created them. Angels don't have any chance to repent. You and I are born like a devil. <laughs> As the Bible says, from the time we're born, born, we've got trouble like the sparks fly upward. And yet in His mercy and His grace, hallelujah, He gives you and I an opportunity to repent. To repent and believe on Christ uh, and uh, to receive the forgiveness of, his sin, of sin and that eternal life. And then to let us be trophies of his grace. And just like Lazarus, you and I have been called from the grave to sit with Christ and enjoy his fellowship. I wonder are we doing that? See, the purpose of, this, of the first and second chapters here uh, uh, of the... Uh, 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 of Ephesians is, is talking about our spiritual riches. And we spend so much time working on and thinking about and planning for worldly riches that we miss in this life everything God intends for us to jo enjoy. Our idea of riches is, is, is way misplaced. So uh, he tells us here that not only then did he... Did he uh, uh, make us objects there by exalting us. But then in verse 7, he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. Verse 8, rather. Um, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We find here that God has secured us. Secured us. We talked about that a moment ago. See, salvation cannot be of works because the work of salvation is already completed. We don't need to add anything to it. We don't need to take anything away from it. One sacrifice, the Lamb of God, has finished the great work of salvation, and God did it all by His grace. And so you think about it. He's exalted us. Uh, he has secured us. And now if you look at verse 10, we are His workmanship. He's working on us. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, Unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God saves us. God secures us. He exalts us. He seals us. And then he works through us to do the same in others. Boy, if we had any appreciation tonight for eternity and spiritual things, it would stir our heart that God, us, God would let us have a part in in that work. We find in verse number 10 of chapter number 5 that salvation's not the end, it's the beginning. It's the beginning. Have you, boy, I'll tell you one thing. Have, have you, have, have, have any of y'all ever visited a church where, 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 they, where they, all they talk about is, is, is being saved? There are churches out there they don't want to be challenged, they just want to be told they're safe in Jesus. Just tell us we're born again. But if that's what we do, then we are not in any way doing anything to let God work through us so that others might be saved because somebody's got to do the work of the Lord. And God wants to do that work through us to get us moving for Him. We are His creation created unto good works. And God works in us to prepare us for His work. For it is God that worketh in you to both, uh, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. <laughs> I was talking with my wife last night. 
And I said, honey, my mind keeps going back to that night on those plant stairs back there. Where after three years of working, God bless, took care of us. You know, I think I shared with you before, there was a period of time there, brother, when I was running from God and His call. I've known a lot of tough things in my life, brain. There ain't nothing tougher than the work of the Lord, I'll tell you that. And I, <laughs> I begged God to take my burden away. I begged God just to let me alone. War weary and war wounded. I said, God, I, it, it's enough already. I've done my 20 years. I'm going to retire. Let somebody else do it. But it's God that works in you. To will <laughs> and to do of his good pleasure. And brother, I'm telling you, it would not go away. As hard as I tried to bury it, as hard as I tried to find some kind of, uh, some kind uh, of, uh, uh, of direction in my career there, new career, whatever you want to call it, I could not find my way. And I began to look around that plant and to see these men and women whose lives were uh, in the state of deception. Whose lives were a wreck. Hey, let me, I tried to cover up my burden by witnessing the people, talking to them about the Lord, inviting them to church. There still wasn't enough. <laughs> God was working in me will and to do of his good pleasure one night I told her last night I said I've been thinking about that stairwell recently where I sat down there broken empty I knew that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life making tables for McDonald's Other people can do that. And so on those stairs that night in the back, nobody saw me, but I was a broken man. And I said, God, I'm sorry. I cannot resist this work and burden that you put in my heart anymore. And I said, Lord, if you'll give me another chance. I'll preach my heart out till I die or Jesus comes. I used to tell people before, I used to tell them, uh, if I couldn't preach, I'd rather die. And then I took those three years trying to hide my burden and I thought I was dead. But God, who is rich in mercy and rich in grace, reminded me that the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. And I said, dear Lord, all over again, I said, here am I. Send me. Because people need the Lord. And you're working in, God, you are working in us to accomplish that work. I was reminded of those verses in Jeremiah, you know. Jer Why do we read the Bible and read the exact state we're in and ignore the Bible? Why do we do that? Because we're stubborn. That's why. <laughs> when old Jeremiah said, I've got a fire in my bones, and I cannot contain. I knew it. I knew it. 
thank God for his work in us so we can work for him. For his work in us so he can work through us. That's what he's designed. Uh, he, the Bible says here we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Look, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What that means is, dear friends, that God saves you and then he works in you because he has a plan for you. And that plan includes the preaching of the gospel of Christ to others. The encouragements of the saints in love, the Bible said. <laughs> Boy, I'm telling you, he uses a number. He uses a Bible. Oh, my. The Bible. Uh, I remember uh, <laughs> uh, we went to this uh, little old church in Tennessee when we got back home. And uh, I'm just going to shoot straight. That thing dead as a doornail. And I was pretty happy about it. Do you know why? Because I was like Jonah a little bit there. You understand? Oh, yeah. It's easy to get comfortable in deadness. Man, miss out on your whole life doing it too. <laughs> and then uh, my wife said, hey, uh, we need to probably think about another church. So we started looking around. And we went down there to Sweet Springs Baptist Church in Ardmore, Alabama. Pastor Joe Logan. He's now pastor in the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, that was, I can't even remember the guy's name now. Dr. Yeah. Harold Seiler. Dr. Harold Seiler. And uh, <laughs> we walked in that church. And I could feel it. And I said, no, no, Lord. Oh, no. God, if I stay here, you're going to have your way. Because I could feel it. And brother, God did. From a pastor that preached like there was no tomorrow. And had a heart for folks. And had a mind to honor Jesus above all. Help me to remember what church ought to be. <laughs> Lasted about a year. And there I was sitting on the steps. I surrender all. I surrender all. Because God was working through us. Wanted to work through us. He used the word of God, boy. He used his prayer. He used his suffering to get us to the place where he can use us for the work of the gospel. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You know what? You can try all you want to, I guess. I don't recommend it. If Jonah were here, he wouldn't recommend it either. You can try all you want to to run from what God wants to do in you. He's going to keep working. And you, got one, you got one shot, man. You either let him do the work and let it be easy, or he'll put a spiritual whoop on you and make you wish you had a. Hmm. Yes, sir. Amen. You know why? Because he's rich in grace. <laughs> he's rich in mercy. And he loved us and loves us with an everlasting love. But he don't love you just for you. He loves you for all them out there that don't yet know him. Amen. His love is never intended to stop with us. It's supposed to work through us. See? Some, some Christians are like a clogged up water line. Stanky and stagnant. Miserable. Brother, because they won't let the Holy Ghost work through them. Amen. We're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to think about something. You know what I forgot in those days when I was wrestling with God about what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do? You know what I forgot in those days? Ephesians chapter 2. 
when I was dead in trespasses and sin. And God in His grace and mercy and love reached down to me and saved me from a devil's hell. I forgot all that. And as the end result, I got out, out, of, the, out of the will and plan of God for my life. It ain't worth it. It's not worth it. Remember. That's what Ephesians 2 is about. Your salvation is part of your great spiritual heritage and your riches. And it's good every once in a while to look back and realize what he did for you. Amen. Let's stand together.